Being that it is Father's Day, I kind of have to pause and stop and reflect on lessons uh, that my dad has taught me. And my, I have come to realize in my older age, um, my dad worked incredibly tirelessly to teach me so many powerful, important, uh, these life-changing lessons uh, through Star Wars. So, yeah, in a sense, um, it's kind of his fault that I have this extreme case of nerdiness. Um, so, I mean, you can take it up with him, but just know that it's something that I treasure and cherish. However, I understood what it was he was doing. One of the things he was trying to do is he was trying to help me learn just even a couple simple truths. First, he was trying to show me what it was like to believe in something bigger than myself, some greater power out there. Yoda, Luke, Obi-Wan, they all believed in something greater than themselves. And I'm not talking necessarily just about the force that they believed in, but they also kind of believed in the spirit of the rebellion. This organization, this entity, this movement, they placed their hopes and trust in that as well. The second thing that he taught me was that the, was that the faith and belief in this something greater allows a person to do the right thing. So because you have this faith, because you have this belief in something bigger than yourself, it gives me, it gives you the power to do that which is right in the world. And I'm like 90% sure that's exactly what he was going for when we would stay up late watching these things. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, that was going through his mind when he was like, hey, I'm going to introduce my son to this series about magic space wizards and we'll see how he handles it. Um, <laughs> but the other thing that it did was it, it really allowed me um, some good quality time with my dad which is always something that's important. And it set me down this Jedi-like path for my own life where my faith allows me to live into something bigger than myself, that I am able to come to grips with the fact that I believe in something much bigger than myself and I can take part in that. And taking part in that, though it may be hard at times, though it may be scary at times, taking part in that is doing the right thing. My faith allows me to understand the cost of discipleship and what it costs you when you do the right thing. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I'm 90% sure most of you do. Um, doing the right thing is seldom easy. It is oftentimes hard, uh, and people will dog you for it. It is, however, as the name implies, the absolute right thing to do. The essence of doing what is right because of the difficulty and cost can only truly be done when your feet are planted firmly in something bigger than yourself. Because of what it takes to stand up against outside forces and outside influences and say, this is wrong and this is what needs change, and you're gonna have people push back against you, okay? Because that's what it takes, you have to be grounded in something bigger than yourself. Now for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, this thing that we are grounded in, the thing that guides our steps and helps us to plant our feet, our feet firmly on the ground is our faith, our faith in God, our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, the belief that we have, all of the things that make up our theology, 
These are the things that plant us and keep us grounded so that we may do that which is right. However, we do have to realize that we will struggle against the evils and the sins of this world. And that is not something that is easy. It can wear us down. But what we know is that when we are empowered by our faith, when our feet are planted firmly in something bigger, we will be able to stand in doing that which is right. The words of Christ in our gospel reading today are meant to, at the same time, sort of terrify and inspire us. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. You see those people out there? Those people who think that you're crazy, that you're nutty, that try to drag you down, that abuse you, that malign you, that gossip about you, all of those things. Do you see all of those people out there? Those are the ones who are coming after you. And they're coming after you because you are speaking my words and you are doing that which you have been called to do. And those people, Jesus says, are cowards. Jesus says, look at the sparrows. Think about sparrows. And I, we see sparrows, at least I think they're sparrows. I know that there are like a lot of different types of birds. So I'm assuming most of the small itty-bitty birds that we see in the trees and stuff flying around, I think they're sparrows, but sparrows are they're kind of these small little birds, right? And they were useful because they procreated very quickly and there were a bunch of them. Uh, they were also very useful not only for eating, but also for sacrifices. And so because there was such an abundance of sparrows, you could actually buy them really cheaply. You could buy them incredibly cheaply. And Jesus says, even those birds, when they fall, one of those little insignificant birds that overpopulate itself, when they fall from a tree, do you know who knows about it? God does. And he says, think about it. You are worth so much more in God's eyes than a bird. You are worth so much in God's eyes, Jesus declares, that all of the hair on your head has been individually counted. And God knows exactly at any given point how much hair exists on your head. Jesus isn't mincing words here. Jesus acknowledges fully that you are going to face trials, that you are going to face tribulations. And when you decide to go with God, people are going to go against you. However, how inspiring is it to know that the creator of the universe the one who set all things in motion, that this almighty, loving, paternal God knows intimate details about you. And that this God not only knows these inane little facts, but loves you. This God created and formed you. This God knows you intimately knows all about you, your likes, your dislikes, all your freckles, all your moles, all the hairs on your head, all of these things. And that in and of itself should give us comfort that this God takes time out of this God's day to know about ourselves. And even if you have to speak out, even if you have to speak out against friends and family and the community, because this God knows you, because this God loves you, that should give you hope. You know that you're doing the right thing because you're going with God. You are doing right 
if you are doing what God tells you to do. And nothing else matters. Jesus says plainly, look, I know that you guys think that I'm some long-haired hippie guy. But I actually came to stir the pot. I came here to change things. And that's what I'm going to do. But I'm here with you as you go through all of this. It's hard. It's hard to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, but it's what's right. Jesus calls us to pick up our crosses daily, to die for, to ourselves in some way, not just our sinful nature, but to put ourselves second, to put ourselves third, to make it so that other people get more than what we have. Usually, you know, when we take up our crosses, it means our old, sinful, our old sinful selves. But it goes deeper than that because following Jesus has a cost. It will cost you everything. If you do this, what you are doing, though, is right in God's eyes. And that is more important than anything else. If someone gets on you for living authentically following Jesus Christ... Guess what? They weren't worth your time to begin with. Now, I would be a fool to think that this is all a good and happy message. After all, what we're talking about when we talk about discipleship, when we talk about doing the right thing, and everything I've been droning on and on for, for about the last 11 minutes or so, is the fact that it's hard and that there is a tangible cost. I fully admit and understand that this is a hard pill to swallow because we, as a people, we don't like to invest in something unless we're able to minimize as many risks as possible. We don't generally like to take risks at times. And this is actually, this belief, this thought, it runs counter to what it is we are supposed to do with faith because our faith is this kind of thing bigger than ourselves that allows us to take these steps, to take these risks, to reach out, and to do that which God has called us to do in the world. True discipleship calls for faith in the face of uncertainty, when you don't know what's going to happen, when you're terrified of what may come, that is when your faith plays a bigger role than you can possibly imagine. And this is what brings us to the story of Hagar and Ishmael. So a little background here. Hagar is the mother of Ishmael, who is the older half-brother of Isaac. You see, Abraham and Sarah, they were told, you know, oh, I'm going to make a great nation through you, and you will be blessed so that you will be a blessing. And they keep trying and trying and trying. And they're like, nothing's happening. No baby. What are we supposed to do? So Sarah, in her infinite wisdom, decides that she knows exactly how God wants to proceed. And so she gives Abraham, her servant, Hagar, to have a child. Now this is problematic in and of itself for a number of reasons that we don't have time to get into all today. What is even more problematic is that Hagar and Ishmael are then dismissed because of Sarah's jealousy. And Abraham is troubled by it. His wife comes to him and says, that boy Ishmael should not inherit what my son should get all of. And Abraham is troubled. And God reassures him. He says, Abraham, I am fully aware how you feel. I mean, this kid is your son, and you care for them. That being said, listen to your wife. Do what she asks. Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, 
do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that your offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So that's what God tells Abraham. So he packs up stuff, gets a water skin, still worried, I would imagine, and sends them out into the wilderness with the bare minimum of what they really need. Because who's going to take care of a random woman with a kid? And they only have one water skin. And it seems essentially like this is some kind of death sentence. And yet Abraham was told by God, don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. You have to trust me. And I don't know about you all, but in this situation, I would kind of be worried. I would kind of think, what part am I playing in this? But he doesn't. You see, there's no way to assume that Abraham didn't love Ishmael because this notion distressed him greatly. And yet, in the midst of this, God says, it will be fine, just do it. It's weird to me because this is a foretaste of the binding of Isaac in the future. I don't personally think that Abraham is okay with this plan. I don't think he necessarily likes it because, again, humans want to micromanage and humans want to control all these little things. And it's like, well, what if, what if I gave them one water skin? What's going to happen to them? He's being asked to give up something important to him, and yet he does it. And this is actually a recurring theme for Abraham that we'll get into next week. The story has a happy ending for a number of reasons. Terrified and not wanting to witness her child to die, she places Ishmael under a bush and goes off to a little way and says, I don't want to see my child die in front of me. That would be horrifying. And yet in the end, God saves the servant who was cast out and her son. God goes on to promise that Ishmael will be the father of a great nation, fulfilling that which was promised. And there's a spring of water. So she's able to refill the water skin. She's able to get a drink. She's able to give Ishmael a drink. But they were outcasts. They were foreigners. Even in the midst of all of this, in the midst of their differentness, God heard their prayer. And God had a plan for them, even before the prayer was given. Because again, God promised Abraham, I'm going to take care of the child. Now, Hagar had no way of knowing this. Ishmael had no way of knowing this. At least based on the text, we don't see that they knew. But what we do know is that there was a promise that God was going to do something. Even to this outsider, God heard this outsider's prayer and answered. And now, through Ishmael, a great nation was born. And interestingly enough, you know, we talk about God and When we talk about the Old Testament, we talk about the three different peoples found in the lineage of Abraham. And we know the Jewish people, and we know the Christian people, and all of that ties back into Abraham. But we also have our Muslim brothers and sisters that are tied to Abraham. Because as it turns out, Ishmael becomes for the Muslim faith, the same thing that Isaac becomes for the Jewish faith and for Christians. None of this, absolutely none of this would be possible if it were not for the personal cost of Abraham. 
being the man of the house, sure, Abraham could have, Abraham could have told his wife to buzz off. I can guarantee you that is never the right answer. Certainly it was in his power, but he didn't. Yet when God intervened, even, through, even though the thought terrified him, he still did what it was that God wanted him to do. And this is what being a disciple is all about. Yet there is also this reward of discipleship. Because being a disciple isn't easy. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, your life will forever be easy if you are a disciple of Christ. It can and will cost you everything at times. But it's what's right. Standing on the promises of God is what's right. Doing what God wants you to do in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of terror, in the midst of being dragged down and pushed down and abused and spit on, that's what's right. Standing up, planting your feet firmly in Jesus' name, and doing that which you have been called to do, that is what's right. And the only way you're able to do this is because you know the truth. You know that there is something bigger than yourself. There's something greater out there, something more important than your comfort or even your happiness at times. Sometimes even your sanity. All of this is more important because there is something bigger out there. And because you have that faith, because you know that everything will eventually be fine in Jesus' name, you are able to take that step in faith and do that which is right. We will be called to make sacrifices. And it will be hard. Yet I assure you this, God is with us. I implore each and every one of you this day to make a stand. Remember the words of Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Stand up. Stand up for justice. Stand up for mercy, stand up for grace, stand up for love, no matter what the cost. Do the right thing. Amen.